was the tomboy, then a water baby, but she ended up a beauty and a star. Today, she is best known for the noble causes she espouses. She also, however, happens to be my guest. Her name is Nafisa Ali. Welcome to the program, Nafisa. Thank you for giving me the honor. Well, I gather your whole life changed when you were 37. You went to Tirupati and you became a completely different person. So let's start there. What exactly happened? I had made a wish and a vow and I said that if it came true, Tirupati is the most uh, religious place to be for a Hindu. And me being a Muslim, I decided to connect with all gods. I went there. Within a month, the wish came true. I went there and I shaved my hair. And you mean you were as bald as an egg? As I was bald and beautiful. <laughs> but I, it, it was, I don't know, not many people I think have shaved their hair, especially if long hair and you suddenly shave it. It's, it's, it's an awesome feeling to feel that freedom. So it was a sort of symbol of the new Nafisa that emerged from Tirupati. Yes, and I remember standing there in front of uh, the, the God and praying. I said, God, I put my life in your hands. You show me the way. And I remember a magazine even wrote that she's, Nafisa uh, is in a midlife crisis, which, was, which it was not. It was a, a certain strength that I derived from being 37. But when you came back and the family suddenly <clears throat> saw mummy completely bald, what did they do? My little son, who didn't know what I was going to do, who was about five, woke, came every morning. He used to come and lie on my tummy. And he did just that. And all the, it was dark. And he, he always ran his fingers through my hair. And then he put his hands on my head. And then he shot up with shock and he looked at me. He says, what happened? I said, oh, no, you don't love me because I have no hair. And he said, no, no, I love you. Then I explained it to him. So they it, took it well. It was at this point that you involved yourself in the struggle to teach people about AIDS and to change their attitude. How exactly did you get involved in that? My, my daughter was not well, and I happened to visit my doctor friend who was in a leukemia hospital for children. And then I saw children of all ages, which disturbed me a lot. And there was one child specifically whose story they told me of how he had developed uh, and been diagnosed with HIV. And the reason he had got it is because his mother, who was born, father was negative. The mother, who, when he was born, had a lot of bleeding and was given transfusion. And so the mother had a child that was born normal and was normal herself, but because of transfusion contacted HIV virus and transmitted to this little child through breastfeeding. And I said, what is this? And so I started reading about it. And that led me onto the journey of which I am today. So it's a long story. But one of the most horrifying things that you experienced as you've involved yourself more and more with AIDS was the fact that bureaucrats would turn around and failed to understand what you were doing. What exactly would they say to you? Well, when I first came to Delhi, which is seven years ago, and I went to the health ministry, and the then senior bureaucrat that I meant, met, and I questioned and talked to, told me that, you know, madam, international organizations come into our country, and they pick up small pocket areas where the ratio or incidence of uh, HIV AIDS is high. And uh, it, we are in, in India not like that. We are culturally not like that. And that really disturbed me because I believe in the land of Kama Sutra <clears throat> and in the land of a billion people. There has to be a certain uh, callousness in our attitude and in naive. We are naive in our views. And you cannot be an ostrich and bury your head and say, think that the problem is going to go away. And these bureaucrats were being ostriches. They would not, they would not recognize the terrible problem that faced us? Well, uh, Karan, this was seven years ago. And a few days ago, I met, met another bureaucrat. When I said that we, the reality is in today in India, we don't have one rupee towards antiretroviral drug therapy, which is helping people, uh, keeping people alive all over the world. And this is my drive and my quest and my, my uh, search to make people understand. And what know? did he say? And he told me, it's not the job of the government. It's the job of the NGO. I have an NGO, and this is what I'm working for. I, and I, it really disturbed me, because in reality, the government needs to understand only then where can we solve the problem. Because that's how internationally the plateau levels are being reached. Now, you threw yourself into this task. Almost your entire soul went into it. One of the great things you did was you got 
cricket stars who'd never been involved in AIDS to make one-minute spots increasing people's consciousness. Was it difficult convincing them? Um, Kapil Dev was the sweetest. I told Kapil, I said, Kapil, you're a, you're a star. I, I'm a great believer in you. Help me do this because the nation will listen to what the cricketers say. And what did he say? He says, definitely, we'll do it. And so we made this big plan. I went to the cricketers. Earlier than that, I, I always gave talks, but I find only my photograph coming out. And that also used to disturb me because I said there's so much that has to be said, not just a photograph. And the cricketers made the difference in so making said, the subject okay, come So out. I said I'll make a documentary and I'll say it my way because that's the only way I can do it because it's me, my view, my thought. So then I made uh, this, these spots. I was able to do it, to put it on air. I think every major channel that is in India aired it free, Karan. This has become, in a sense, a mission and a driving motivation for you. Yes, because subsequently I made a documentary on HIV AIDS. And, and the, when I was making this documentary, I met a woman who had bed sores. That I, uh, it, it really disturbs me because she was a, a sex worker. It doesn't matter how you got it, but nobody would touch her. Her sister went away, who looked after her. She got bed sores that were big gaping holes in her thighs where you could see her ball and socket joints. Her, all her cockics on her on her back all were visible. There she had uh, bed sores on her on her back. Every rib and her lungs moving could be seen. She was choking with tuberculosis. She had no strength. What did you do? I held, I was documenting this and I was holding her hand and and she didn't have the strength to cough and it, and as a human being when I uh, over and above everything else that I saw when I saw her. And I looked into her eyes and I knew that I could not help her and I knew that she had to die. And I said, I don't want her life to go in vain. I want to be able to do more because if I have seen and if I do nothing, then I am a worthless human being. And my search in life has to be, or try to be a better human being. I get the feeling that in throwing yourself body and soul into the struggle to help victims of AIDS, in a way you fulfilled yourself, in a way you've satisfied an urge that you had to do something? Oh, Karan, it's not that. It's I want antiretroviral therapy uh, to be uh, made available to people in India and patients, and I want to be involved myself trying to be able to do that. And I'm very happy and proud in a way that the Delhi government is supporting me. So this the is the new Nafisa. Nafisa is now part of a cause. She's no longer just a model, no longer just Miss India. I think it's my being a swimmer that has given me this focus, this drive, this will not to give up. Let's talk about the life you led up till this point when the cause took over, because it was very different. <coughs> you grew up in a little village 25 miles from Calcutta. What sort of childhood was that? Well, I didn't grow up there, but that's my ancestral home where we went every weekend. My family graveyard is there. All my ancestors are buried there. So it's a there's this big, huge old mango tree where we used to lie under and there was a pond which we used to swim with and we used to play bang bang with all our village cousins and friends and we used to run around all over the countryside and steal chana from the fields of somebody and eat it and you know those sort of things that's what I've done so I think that's helped me uh, be a madcap uh, uh, be normal be grounded it sounds like an idyllic childhood your father had three wives, so did you grow up with lots of brothers and sisters? Was it a big, large, happy family? Well, well my father was married once, the first wife, which I have two beautiful sisters called Anissa and Salima. And I don't think if I had had uh, my own sisters, I would have been as close to a s sister. So, and my aunt is a wonderful human being who is also uh, part of our life. We all didn't live in the same house, but we were always all together. And uh, subsequently, after my parents separated, my dad married for the third time. But that, that comes much later, after I got married. So I still believe that family is irrespective. I think if, if parents separate, even though I was married, it still disturbs you a lot. Because after all, parents are parents, and you love them for being that. You mentioned that you were a swimmer, and much of your drive comes from swimming. And yet I believe it all began in the village pond. <laughs> yeah, because in our village pond, we were all involved in digging that pond and full of fish and we used to swim, we used to climb up the coconut tree and jump in and we used to have a lot of fun. And uh, 
And I think my swimming training years have also been in all the, uh, the, the big lakes of Calcutta. The amazing thing <coughs> is that you became Bengal champion when you were just 15 and national champion when you were 17. How much of it was glamorous and fun and how much of it was dedication and hard work? To be very honest, that's why I don't understand why people call me glamorous or sometimes I'm called a social. I don't understand why because I, I work so hard, I struggle, I achieve, I dedicate my life to, a, uh, to sport. You know, I have, I have swum for so many years. I have lived a life as a hermit, you know, because five in the morning, training, school, invariably by the last period I had to fall asleep. I had long, beautiful hair and my coach said that if you want to be a national swimmer, then either you have long hair or you cut your hair. So and you I, cut it off? So I went to my, I thought about it and I went to my sister one day and I made a ponytail. I had long down to my hips. I told my sister, now just cut it. She says, oh, you know, no, no. I said, no, just cut it. Otherwise, I know I'll never do it. So I chopped my hair off and my mother, I gave her the hair. I said, now you make a wig. And she was so horrified at all these things that I did. It was about that time, just before you'd become national champion, just after you'd become Bengal champion, that the junior statesman did a big color piece on you. They had a particular phrase for you. Do you remember it? Yeah. yeah I was nicknamed the sizzling water baby of Bengal. And... Uh, it was, you know, I had broken 14-year-old record, 17-year-old record, suddenly in Bengal, and suddenly I came on this cover. And Raj Kapoor saw this cover, and he wrote to my father, and he said, I'm interested in casting your daughter in a film, and uh, what do you think? Of course, promptly the reply went, no, she's not <laughs> training for her nationals, and she's in school, and I was Were you 16. disappointed? I didn't think about it. It was not important at that time. I think about it now. But I gather the film went on to become a very famous one. He was wanting to cast you for Henna. Henna, yeah. But his, in his lifetime, he never made it. And there were many occasions that we met over the years. And he used to always tell me, he says, Apne, you did not work in my film. And I used to... Uh, subsequently, I worked in his brother's film, Shashi Kapoor's film, and we made Janu. But Raj Kapoor always remembered that you never did Henna. Yeah. And in a way, I do regret it because he was such a master in, in cinematography and... But you know, the amazing thing is you became national champion at a relatively young age, you were only 17 and having achieved this pinnacle, you stopped swimming. I stopped swimming because at 17 I don't think a swimmer goes much further and I did never wanted to be beaten. And you realized all of that at that young age? I have always been a great uh, or a deep thinker and uh, sitting on my village pond, questioning God, are you there? Prove to me you're there. Then I say, forgive me, God, I, I know you're there. You know, so there was, there was always the search of something. I've always been a search. And you decided you wanted to quit being a swimmer when you were on top? Yes, and I took up skull boat uh, racing with a group of friends you know, in, on the lakes, and we won all the championships for three years running. And then I became an amateur jockey. And I, I did and so you said well. to yourself, I'm going to get out of this before I start losing. I'm quitting on top. Yes, I have to. I'm, I hate being a loser. Let's take a break then, Afisa. I want to come back in part two and talk about the amazing career that was about to begin as you stopped being a national swimming champion and turned your attention to other horizons. We'll be back in just a couple of moments. Stick with us. Welcome back. My guest is Nafisa Ali. When people talk about Nafisa, they think of the actress, the model, but they seem to forget that you were also Miss India. Although the strange thing is that you joined the competition for the weirdest of reasons. Well, I thought it was a very sensible reason because I think television had hit India in 74, 75, if I'm correct. And the prize was the television and my parents wanted to buy one and I said, no, no, I'll win it for you. So I thought it was a very sensible reason. So you mean you became Miss India because you wanted to gift your parents a television set? Yes, because being a Miss India doesn't prove anything because I think mo all women in India are beautiful. But in fact your father took it much more seriously than you did. He actually made plans to help you, didn't he? Yes, because big tomboy that I was and an athletic champion, swimming champion, he says, oh, oh, now you have to be a lady. So mom and dad put two mirrors on either side of the room big long le uh, full length mirrors and I had to practice walking with my head up and not like 
that. <laughs> so I, th I have to thank my father and mother yet again because it's whether it was swimming or whatever it was I did, I think it was with the, the grace, the goodwill and the perseverance of my parents, otherwise I wouldn't have done it. But that night as the results were being announced, were you nervous? Were you expecting to win? Yes. You were? Of course. You were absolutely convinced you were going to yes. do it? There wasn't even a moment of hesitation? No. Right? It's the hesitation only came subsequently when I went for the Miss International contest. I arrived at night. Nobody was there. I went to sleep, woke up in the morning and came out and found these beautiful 62 tall contestants. And that, I got such a shock. I remember I turned right around, went back to my room, put on three inch heels and came back. I said, OK, at least I'm, now I'm ready. Now, the thing that everyone does remember is the movie that you did. It was the first one. After the Raj Kapoor offer got turned down, you did Janoon with his brother Shashi. But in fact, it was his son Kunal who really chose you, didn't he? Yeah, my gosh. I, I always thank Kunal for this because it was Raj Kapoor's birthday. I was in Bombay and I met Shashi and Kunal and Karan. And subsequently, when I was modeling in Bombay, it was Karan, uh, Kunal who told me that Sham was looking for a girl and why don't I go and meet him and I said no I'm not interested in film and it was his perseverance one month later when I left Bombay that he took the photographs and gave it to Sham and next day Sham Benegal call, called me at home for breakfast and you were no. more interested in what you were eating than what for, he no, was he, no well it was in the sense that he said you have to come to Bombay again because I have to meet you because you play a much younger girl it was my 21st birthday and my father left the decision to me so I came to Bombay and over breakfast I had Sham Benegal looking at me like this and I was busy eating, I was very happy, I loved to eat. After, t after some time I noticed that he kept staring at me and I said, now please stop because I get a stomachache if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back and I was staying with Shashi and Jennifer Kapoor and he called me and he says, why don't you come and try on your Junoon dress? And when I put it on, I f it felt so right. You felt at home? Because it was such a beautiful story, a true story written by Ruskin Bond called The Flight of Pigeons about an English girl. I just felt it was wonderful. Fifteen years later, you made your second film, Major Sub. What tempted you back? I think it's more than fifteen years. Close to, I think, twenty years that I made Major Sub. Because um, my kids had grown up. I was in Delhi. Amitabh is Amitabh. We all have treated him as an idol. And he was one actor that I really wanted to act with. But for six years, he had disappeared. There was no, he was not acting then, and suddenly he started acting again. Uh, and it was, you know, I have this problem with, in life that I always want to get something. <laughs> so it was an internal, internal thought. And Tinu Anand rang me up, and he says, will you act in my film with Amitabh? So I said, well, in Janoon, I acted as an English girl, and that label has stuck with me. If you make me an English girl, I don't want to act. He said, no, you'll play an Indian, an army officer, and a doctor. I said, wow, that's fabulous. So, so the combination did it? Perfect combination. In 78, you met the man you married, the polo player Pickle Sodi. Did you fall in love at once, or did you woo him for a long, long time? When I was 17, Karan, I remember seeing the movie called The Gatsby with Robert Redford. And for me, I thought if I ever marry a man, he has to have that sort of charm and class and style and dignity and love for a woman. So Pickles reminded you of Robert Redford? And I, Pickles is much older than I am, for almost 14 years old. And I found all these qualities and a certain prince in him. And I said that this is the man that I would like to have children with. That was my main. Who would be my kid's father? <laughs> But you keep telling people in all your interviews that you <coughs> married Pickles because you were fascinated by his horses. Yes, he's a polo player, Arjuna Wadi, one of our leading polo players of our country. And uh, I loved horses. I love animals. And I told him, I used to, you know, never let a man get too egocentric. So I said, my, I've only married you because of your horses. <laughs> <laughs> you spent a decade and a half as an army wife. How did they take you? Were they a bit hesitant about the model, the actress, the Miss India? Or did they just warm to you from the word go? I don't think people realized who I was because I bl I'm like a chameleon. I blend in any atmosphere and, and I feel happy wherever I am. And in fact, my friends subsequently later on, years later, have got to know who I was. And they said, you know, why didn't you tell us? I said, it's not important. What is important is the friendship we share. And I love army life. I'm so happy 
I came from a background that knew nothing about the army, and I must say the bro brotherhood, the love, uh, the the bonding, and the atmosphere in which I have lived and brought my kids up have been a wonderful experience, and I really treasure and cherish those years in my army. Your friends say that she's a lady who lives life as it comes, but always makes sure that she lives it on her own terms. Would you agree with that? I'm a I'm a I'm a great believer in in what is right. And therefore, I live life on my own terms, and I, I don't get under pressure. If I believe something to be true, I go after it. Are you a very moral person? Very moral in the sense because I believe that I'm only answerable to God and my conscience. And for me, those two things are the only things that matter. It doesn't matter what others may think or believe. I have to believe in myself. You know, it's interesting, you've mentioned God two or three times in this interview. You even said at one point that you speak to him. Do you sort of have a personal relationship? Is he, is he a friend to you? I would put it the easiest way in modern languages. I have this direct internet, or inter, uh, yeah, internet with God. I directly link up all the time. I find myself talking all the time. And I you believe, actually sit and talk to him? Yeah, mentally. You don't have to stop have a verbal conversation. But what I really believe, as I have I have searched through my life is that in within us is there is a sixth sense and an intuitive power, a strength that if you home on to or believe in or search for, it comes to you, solutions come to you. But you have to learn that. You know, in life we're not born, born knowing everything. And that's what I call my God in power. He's there within me. He's there externally to remind me. People say that Nafisa has all the makings of an excellent politician, but she's shying away from becoming one. She simply won't take the plunge. How much of that do you disagree with? Well, for me, Paul, I love people. I love to work for people because in life, I have life has treated me well. I want to do for children. I want to do for women. I want to do for our country. I want a secular country. I want people to love each other through a link of religion. You're beginning to sound like a politician, am I wrong? Well, the politician today has a problem talking about u unity in religion. And I find that the biggest obstacle in the path of an Indian mind, because democracy, secularism is the most powerful force that our country has. And I don't want that to be moved or shattered in any way. I think I can see a new Nafisa, but I think time alone will reveal if I'm right or wrong. It's been a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Kara.